I started my career when there was no proper tools to gauge the quality of the code which is getting generated in a giant monolithic code base which was based on IBM Rational Clear case. The code reviews were done by a proprietary tool and it was very tedious to do the code review process because you need to log into a Solaris host and only one person can log in at a time. And most of us were using IDEs as a static copy and they were stale because most of the code resides inside a proprietary server where you can log in with only one username. However, things are not the same. The industry has embraced change and they have grown a lot from there. Likewise, programming languages, coding style, practices and the tools kept on changing and some of them are the new normal these days. We are going to see some of the practices which I follow while I code. Let's get started. Press the bell icon on the YouTube app and never miss any updates from Tech Primes. IDEs are your best friends. Every time a new version of IntelliJ IDEA is launched, I look for new features and see if it makes sense because I want to be more productive. Like anyone else, I started off with Eclipse, however, it was very heavyweight and it made me to move towards this new IDE called IntelliJ IDEA, which I found out in 2012. Since then, I have never looked back. I've been using IntelliJ for a while and I leverage most of its features and I never changed my keyboard shortcuts to apply Eclipse shortcuts. That helped me to be more productive and write clean code by leveraging the features of the platform. Let's take an example. So this is an example code from the project um, called Micronaut. So if you had seen my videos on Micronaut, this is something similar to Spring Boot, but it does something more than Spring Boot. Now coming to the IDE usage, if you look at this particular method, there are some for iterations, then there is a if loop and stuff like that. So if let's say I want to do a null check on type. So what I will be doing is I will be, let's remove this if block and I'll show you how quickly I can do the null check by writing it. So in, in fact, to leverage the features, you will have to identify these features from the release notes. I'll give the link for the release notes in the description. You can take a look at the IntelliJ IDEA release notes to get the features. Now looking at how do we do a null check automatically. So you can type the variable and press dot and this suggests you with the default options which the IntelliJ provides. See these are the options which IntelliJ provide. These are not from the class. So if I, let's say I want to do a null check, I'll just do a type dot null and I can press the tab option. And if I press the tab option, see that IntelliJ suggests that this will get automatically converted into a if block. So now I'm going to press the tab option and it gets converted into a if loop automatically and I can just press the continue option. So this is one way of leveraging the IDE in order to type faster. For example, uh, let's uh, iterate the parameters, right? So for the parameters, there are different ways of iterating it. For example, here they have used a for each kind of pattern. But if let's say I'm doing a for i, it will automatically do the iteration based on for, which was the old styled way of iterating a for loop. However, if I want to do a new way of doing by for each, I can do a alt enter and it, this shows up an option called iterate and if I press the iterate, it automatically converts this into a for loop. Similarly, if let's say you want to have a try block, if let's say as a part of this, I want to put this into a try block, I can do a dot after the statement and I can press the enter option and automatically the statement will be converted into a try catch block. So this is another way you can leverage the IDE to generate code automatically and it helps you in making your life productive by typing or suggesting things automatically and you don't have to do or worry about the spacing part because most of the time when you start typing let's say type equal to null you end up not giving space or whatever right so if you leverage the features of the IDE it is going to give you these kind of clean code. The next one is getting inspiration from others. 
I always look for open source code in GitHub and I always compare my coding style with that of the open source code. So this way I compare the benefits of what is there inside the platform and what I bring in to the platform. Let's look at an example code from the same repository. So for example, look at this particular block. This is the block which says log.isdebug enabled and if the logging is debug enabled, I want to execute this set of blocks. However, internally I have log.debug and then I, there is a for loop and then, do, and then again we are doing a log.debug. If you understand theoretically, what happens during a log.debug is it is going to skip the statement because let's say if the log level is info in my program, obviously this log statement will not be executed, right? But why do we have to enclose this with an if statement, right? This is done because log.debug gets executed even if you don't enable the debug level because the Java platform executes line by line. However, your logging level is all controlled by a logging framework. So if let's say we have all these four statements in our block outside the if loop all these statements will be executed and then they will be skipped so if you look at the for loop iteration there are different values and we are iterating it and then printing it right so this is going to take a lot of time while we are executing this particular constructor so hence we are checking if the log is disabled and controlling the flow of the execution at this level itself so if the log is debug enabled that is when this block of statements are going to be executed or else they won't even be reached by the program at the runtime. So if you look at it, this is something which I learned by looking at others code. So when I worked in my previous firm, I got to know about this particular logic because I never knew why people have been doing is debug enabled, especially in the constructor, right? Because when the program started, the constructor is going to be executed only once. And I was thinking why the hell people are doing this, but it is efficient way of making sure your program loads faster and making sure you don't disrupt the flow of the execution. The next way is keep it simple. I would like to keep the naming conventions, the classes, the packages, functions and the variables very simple. This allows me to easily type the class names and I don't have to remember huge class names. So if you look at this class, it can be simplified by creating packages. For example, I can have it under com servlet command line and then processor. Under the processor, I can have the internal handler. So the class name would be just internal handler.java. However, the packages will be different for the processor. Same way there was a transformer class. So I would create two different packages and the files are different under different packages. So there will be an internal handler in the processor and an internal handler in the transformer. Same way there was an external handler. That way it was very easier for us to navigate inside the code base. So this seems much simpler than this huge naming convention. Same way there are functions inside these classes which are again huge. The naming convention says handle internal command line processor. We already know that it's going to handle the internal command line processor because the package signifies that. So why do we have to again do it, right? Instead, we can just make the method name as handle. So that way, it's easy for us to understand the code because when the code grows huge inside this particular class, it's easy for us to look at the code and understand what it does based on your navigations, your functions return type and your arguments. So for example, let's say as a part of the transformer, we need to convert from one object to another. So we are going to create a method called transform. In a general case scenario, how people do it is, people create transform from string to int. So this is generally how I have seen people doing it because they want to make sure the function name signifies what you are converting and from what. So this is how they do it, isn't it? So you transform from a string to an integer. However, if let's say I want to do it, I do it this way. I'll just na name the method as transform because I know the arguments are going to be string 
and my return type is going to be integer so i know what it is converting that way i can retain all my functions with different overloading methods so i can do a transform by providing a string and then it can return different types so that way the code looks neat than the one we are doing here so i wouldn't argue with you saying okay why i am not doing this but for me the transform method signature here tells me that transform is a method which is getting an argument as string and then it is converting and giving it as integer that's what all we wanted so i don't want to give that in the function or the method name itself so these are the naming conventions which i follow when i code and i keep it as simple as possible So the next one is overkilling with validations. I've seen people adding null checks to get rid of null pointer exceptions. However, they do it in every function just to get 200 percentage confidence. I don't know how that 200 percentage came into the picture because there is only 100 percentage confidence in something which you do, right? Let's take a look at a code which is doing the same. So we already have the transform method here which is converting our string into an integer right right now we don't have anything done there right however imagine the transform method is going to be called from the handle and inside the transform i have a null check for my variable so if there is a null then i'll return zero and if there is no null i'll just return one for now right so this is a typical way where there is already a null check inside the transform now we don't have to explicitly do a null check on this particular handle method because we know that the transform is going to do a null check and return the value anyway. So unless or until there is a need for you to do a null check here, never do it. So you're adding one more iteration in order to check if the variable is null, which is unnecessary. So if let's say we want to make sure that transform doesn't get a null value at all, we can do that by providing a annotation here called the not null annotation. And the compiler will make sure that you're not adding anything to a variable which is passed which can be null so that way you will be added with a validation which will make sure you're not passing null values to this particular transform so this is something which i personally use when i don't want to use too many null checks in the code the next one is getting constant feedbacks over the past years i've realized that feedback is something which no one wants during a code review process if everything was perfect, we would have never been creating and maintaining these code. That's the point which most of us leave out. I received almost 50 comments on the way I used to write my code in the first code review in my career. The positivity which I carried through those years made me to learn a lot. In order to ignore all these problems, you can use the right tools which can enhance your coding skills and these tools gives you constant feedbacks using which you can fix your code before showing it to somebody else. In addition to that, leverage the tools provided by the ID like what I am doing and adapt to the style if it makes your life easier. Last but not the least, never shy away from asking someone why the code was written in such a way because there could be n number of historical reasons why the code was written in that way. Understanding the decision would give you more clarity and you will be able to take future decisions based on the existing ones and it will help you make a better architect. These are some of the practices which I follow. While these changes over a period of time and technologies evolve, so I have made a mention of only the important ones which I use to make my code stand out from others. I hope you found this particular video interesting. As always, if you like the video, go ahead and like it. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, go ahead and subscribe to it. Meet you again in the next video. Thank you very much.